I was born in this city to godly parents who prayed mightily for me so that by his grace a second birth took place here and my heart rejoices in that. Naturally then it is exciting to be here, to be at home with you. But I can tell you in spite of the fact that I have brothers and sisters and relatives in this place, it would be exciting to talk to you anywhere. And I appreciate the opportunity. From the beginning I have liked what you've called these elaborate gatherings, festivals of faith. And the idea of a festival is the idea of a celebration. And I knew that by the time I stood before you, you would have heard powerful messages from God through his ministers. And I thought perhaps it might be useful today just to say to all of us, let us make sure that we have a faith to celebrate. In Luke chapter 18, Jesus had just finished speaking parabolically concerning the end of the world and the day of vengeance for his people. And he concluded that parable with this rhetorical question, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith in the earth? For well, what is faith? It is variously defined, and I suppose the most simple definition is that faith is belief. And yet there are at least two kinds of that. The Lord said, if you had the faith of a grain of mustard seed, you could move mountains, the belief in God. But the question is asked by St. Paul, or rather the counsel is given, examine yourself to see if you are in the faith. Referring to a message, the system of truth, which you have espoused. Some time ago, I was lecturing at the Kettering Medical College, and on a blackboard in a room where I stood alone, someone had put these words. Faith is an attitude toward God of love, trust, and deep admiration. It means having enough confidence in God based upon overwhelming evidence revealed to be willing to believe whatever he says, accept whatever he offers, do whatever he wishes without reservation for the rest of life. I copied that and put it in my Bible. This element of faith is so essential to our salvation and well-being. For the Bible says... Without faith, it is impossible to please God. As a matter of fact, the Bible declares that our initial approach or response to the grace of God is one of faith. For those who come unto God must first believe that he is. And after believing, the Apostle Paul says in Hebrews 10, The just shall live by faith. St. Paul was actually quoting the Old Testament but in the Greek language, he had a specific meaning. He said, you will survive these troublous times by faith. And so Christ asks this disturbing question, shall he find faith in the earth? This striking query is preceded by the parable of the unjust judge and the fortunate or the importunate widow. And when you read that simple story, you ask yourself, how she pressed her petition before the judge. And remember that prayer is the key in the hand of faith. Prayer without faith is inconsequential and futile. But prayer in the hand of faith can move the arm of God. And Christ is talking about that kind of prayer. Oriental judges were very different and were regarded differently than judges are today. And this specific judge was in his very nature incapable of understanding or feeling the force of that widow's appeal because Jesus said he was unjust. 
Sometimes fear of retribution will arouse in a man a sense of rectitude and impel him towards acts of justice. But not this man, for the Bible says he feared neither God nor man. In his parable, therefore, the unjust judge is not a sketch of what God is, but sadly, he is a sketch of what many think him to be, owing to oppression and disease and suffering and the misrepresentation of the devil and wicked men. And so harassed by doubts and wounded and terrified and driven to the edge of despair by the seeming unbroken stillness of the unanswering heavens, the church of God is as the helpless widow, powerless, poverty-stricken, needing help. And yet the church is mighty. Though this portraiture of a grim and impassive Godhead is thrust upon her, she will not receive it. She will continue to press her plea before God. If she is dealing with one whom no cries for pity or claims of justice can arouse, and no aspect of misery can soften a touch, then nothing remains but to wear him out with a might of her weakness through her unceasing supplication. She will continue to badger him until he must answer. Someone has said if at first you strike the flint and it does not produce fire, then strike it again and again. Why does our Lord use this analogy in his preaching? Why not have the judge conform more to his own image? Should he have done that, it would have only taught feebly by comparison what is taught mightily by contrast. The ground of our confidence after reading this parable is furnished not in the similitude of God to man, but in the infinite disparity. That widow had power, though she was powerless. That power was not in her eloquence, for she uttered only eight words. It was not in the justice of her cause. The judge was not moved by that. He finally answered, she worries me, that's all. She won't let go. That's all, and that moved him. And I think if we're going to be young people of faith, we've got to be young people of prayer. But I would like to say to you today that prayer is the expression of faith, and you may pray about any need. You may pray for length of life, as Hezekiah did. You may pray for divine help, as Daniel did. You may pray for light, as blind Bartimaeus did. You may pray for rain, as Elijah did for a son as Hannah did, or for a lost article as I did. You may pray about any need. And you may pray anywhere. You may pray on the sea as Peter did, or under the sea as Jonah did. You may pray in a desert wilderness as Hagar did, or on a cross as the thief did. You may not only pray for any need or anywhere, but you may pray anyhow. You may pray a short prayer as Peter did, or a long one as Moses did. You may pray in silence as the woman who touched the hem of his garment did. Or you may pray in a crowd as the Syrophoenician woman did. Or in your tears as the woman caught in adultery did. And you may pray any time. In the morning as David did, at noon as Daniel did, at midnight as Paul and Silas did. You may pray in your childhood as Samuel did. You may pray in your youth as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. You may pray as an adult as the jailer did, or in old age as Simeon did, or when you lay down to die as Christ did. But in any case, learn to pray. And to talk to God, pray on. Though wounds come instead of healing, for the Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 8, we looked for peace and no good came, and for a time of health and low trouble. David intones in Psalm 65 in verse 5, By terrible things in righteousness wilt thou answer us. 
Oh, ladies and gentlemen, God does not always say yes when we want him to. But the dark providences of God cast us often into the crucible of fire. And if God does so, it is never that we might be destroyed, but that we might be refined until his image shines in us. And so pray on. Though your former petitions are already cluttered at the throne, pray on. Take another petition there and another there. Carry much business to Christ, your mediator. Give him employment as your intercessor. And as you pray, know that in his good time, he will answer. For the Bible says, the needy will not always be forgotten. And the poor shall not perish forever. Pray on. You know, prayer is natural to humanity. The knowledge of our weakness sooner or later is forced upon us. And with it, an awareness of our dependence upon something or someone greater and wiser and more powerful. And this necessitates prayer, which is the language of the frail to the mighty. Men have an irresistible instinct to pray. Though the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing, there are times that ring prayer. Even from the lips of the atheist, there are dangers that can come to the body and the soul, and all classes find prayer appropriate. There are fears and terrors and doubts which mingle together and call forth involuntary petitions. And then when a man stares death squarely in the eye, the citadel of, a, of maintained unbelief is swept away, and prayer rushes in on despairing shrieks. There's an interesting fellow I like to read. His name is Patrick McManus, an outdoorsman. He wrote not long ago of taking a canoe ride with a friend of his who was an atheist. And as they were paddling the canoe along a peaceful river, they made a wrong turn. And before they realized it, they were caught in the rapids hurtling down the white water toward what seemed to be certain death. McManus said that as they were flying down the channel, suddenly his atheistic friend began to express doubts concerning the intellectual validity of atheism. McManus said then as the little canoe ricocheted off a submerged boulder, he heard the atheist begin to pray. Then he said, as we hurled on down in a trough of raging liquid fluid, his atheistic friend suddenly professed religion. Then he said, as we were paddling ourselves furiously out of the vortex of a whirlpool, the atheist suddenly said he'd been called to preach. The point is, ladies and gentlemen, there are times when all men pray. Voltaire ended his life screaming the name of Christ and begging for mercy. He had been an unbeliever. Thistlewood cried out in his death throes, Oh God, if there is a God, save my soul if I have a soul. And Thomas Paine, the great American patriot who wrote that book, The Age of Reason, in the room of death, cried out, I would give worlds if I had them, if that book had never been written. God have mercy, O oh Christ have mercy. And according to the Bible, one of the last prayers the world will ever hear will be the prayers of the lost, crying to the rocks and to the mountains, fall on us. Prayers forced from reluctant lips, for the Bible declares the time will come when every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. My young friends, I say to you in the words I saw written on the side of a church long ago, repent now and avoid the rush at doomsday. When a pump is frequently used, it does not require priming in order to get water. The first stroke will bring water. But when you don't use the pump, you have to carry on furiously to bring the water up. Learn to pray without ceasing and to be instant in prayer. 
For without prayer, you're not going to carry out your intentions. But someone asked me once, how can God, how can God who has to look after the whole universe have room for me? And I ask, why not? Is God so small that he must distinguish between imperial and provincial cares like a man sitting on a throne? Does God have domestic and foreign policy? Because God can take the inaudible moan of a little child to his heart, does that mean he cannot keep an eye on the planets Pluto and Neptune? Oh, ladies and gentlemen, let's get a larger concept of our God. For all things are little to God. Our vastness is a vastness of littleness. Somewhere in our faith, we've got to lay hold of the idea that there is a relationship between the infinite and the finite. His eye is on the sparrow. And if God watches a little bird, certainly he cares about you and your misery and in your quest for eternal life. So the question today is not, is God able? The question is, shall he find faith when he comes? For he knows that faith is at the root of all Christian zeal and activity. And he implies in his question, he's going to be searching for faith. From the college to the cottage, from the ghetto to the throne, he's going to be looking for faith. Christ raised this question because it ought to be raised. We who are here today, those who are the most hopeful in this auditorium, ought to ponder this question. And the reason is... That right now, many processes are in vigorous action to destroy, misplace, displace, and replace faith in God. The great controversy going on is a battle for the control of men's minds. And wickedness is walking the earth like an Hindustan monster, dragging away all susceptible and vulnerable and weak souls. Ladies and gentlemen, all wickedness is not theological as we think of it. There is what we know to be lateral wickedness, or wickedness between man and man, or man and woman. There are those today who want to indulge this wickedness, and in an effort to do so, they seek to liberalize God and modernize God. The Bible says he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God will not change. We've got to change. And we might as well settle that. Perversions that before were unspeakable in proper company now cry for the garments of normalcy and respectability, if not the garments of righteousness. A man on national television took the Bible and read the condemnation of homosexuality, spit in the Bible, cast it to the ground, while men and women applauded. Marriage and virtue are becoming passé. Chastity and purity are considered silly. Lateral wickedness aimed at destroying your faith and your first inclination toward it will generally be sympathy and hospitality after that indulgence. Secondly, There are stirrings and rushings of activity in the spirit world. Inexplicable spiritistic phenomena are taking place around us all the time. Television and movies are using spiritistic themes. They talk about close encounters of the third kind. Dark shadows. Night stragglers. Mind preparation for the great deception. I don't want you to separate from this many of the ecstasies and religious thrills in religious services. One psychiatrist wrote about it and spoke of body manipulation, sensual massage by demons. So that thrills have come through possessionism and all the while they are screaming the name of Jesus and uttering unintelligible babblings called tongues. 
while demons caress them and make them feel good so that their religion is more a feeling than a faith and more of emotions than intelligent reason and the word of God. Oh, my young friends, the heart gravitates toward practical materialism as a stone gravitates toward the ground. And history today is a history of the secularization of mankind. The increasing dominance of science with its apparent ability to explain all mysteries and provide all comforts is adding to the secularization of the world because it casts forth God as superfluous and irrelevant to man's experience. One writer has said that secularism is practical atheism. And right in the church, it is possible to love things and stuff so much that we put them ahead of God. And in doing so, we have become idolaters. Religious leadership is capitulating to science and offering no check on secularization. And this world is cold and hard and mean and oppressive without God. We're talking about a rat race and dog eat dog. Without God, men feel they can sin with impunity. Without God and a consciousness of our responsibility to him, men rationalize their devilish acts. So that today many feel that stealing and embezzling are human rights and looting a civil right. And unconscionable crimes are being perpetrated today. And the world has become dangerous as never before. And one reason is heaven has become unreal. Science allows no world beyond this one. And by denying creation, they deny the fall of man and therefore the need for man's redemption. And as the earth looms larger, we find people right in our church amongst our congregations who are being shamed out of the blessed hope. The world mocks and laughs and accuses us of seeking pie in the sky by and by. And we become embarrassed and develop inferiority complexes. And we give in. When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith in the earth. I want to tell you today, if you lose confidence in the mansions Christ has gone to prepare, then buying a home on earth will become your magnificent obsession. Ladies and gentlemen, if you lose confidence in the treasures of heaven, then greed will overtake you. And your goal will be, to, will be to become rich and increased with goods and nothing else. Today, in the highest professions, many are becoming professional extortioners, overcharging the poor for treatment and help. Greed avarice, grasping until they become the richest bodies in the cemeteries. If you lose confidence in the promise of eternal joy, then excitement on earth will involve all of your energies and you will be caught up in orgies of concupiscence, interminable rounds of cheap pleasure. That's what's happening today. Yet in spite of it, man hears distant rumblings and sees blinding flashes. His scientific genius has produced weapons capable of destroying the world, either by accident or by design. Men are seeing themselves doomed to annihilation without God, caught in the mutually suicidal endeavors of the great powers of earth. So that the world that is too much with us sometimes is not enough after all. We must hope beyond this world with an endless hope or face a hopeless end. I want to say to you today that a man is not necessarily a genius 
because he can doubt God and put hard questions and make fun of the scriptures. A kind of grim respectability now rests in some quarters and is attached automatically to unbelief and skepticism. A man who knows nothing, if he describes himself as an agnostic, is considered an advanced thinker today. And room is made for him in intellectual and philosophical circles. A man who can put down the Bible and won't go to church and spends his time in lofty contemplations threading his dim and dangerous way through firmaments of undiscovered stars is thought to be a wise man, the ultimate in progressive thinking. But let a man announce that he is orthodox, that he believes the Bible, that he obeys the Ten Commandments, that he is sound and satisfied with great doctrines of Scripture that have been well tested. Let a man announce that he loves Jesus and is satisfied with his righteousness, and instantly that man is believed to be dull and behind the age, and square, and prudish. And again, we develop our little inferiority complexes. But let a man doubt truth, and cross-examine the Bible, and hit out with unbelief. That man is considered to be a man of cerebral might, deserving a high chair in the synagogues of progress. I say, phooey, all of that. A man kicking against the word of God is simply bruising his own foot and breeding mortification in his own toe. They had a smart aleck on television recently who was questioning his own existence. He said, how can I be sure that I exist? I can't even see all of myself. I can see my feet and my legs. I can't see my eyes. I can't see the back of my head. And they thought enough of that stupidity to give him prime time on television. I judge that if he doubts his existence, he ought not buy any food or clothing until he knows he exists. The problem is that man has gone wrong in his heart. And he enjoys being wrong. And he doesn't intend to change. So he is trying to suit his intellectual condition to his carnal feeling. So he argues with the Ten Commandments because he wants to indulge unlimited moral license. But ladies and gentlemen, we are made in the image of God. And there are built into us certain moral prohibitions which must be overcome. A man who wants to go to hell has got to struggle and scratch and kick and fight his way to hell. A man resisting God is catching it hard. Dwight Moody said, I've never met an honest man who found fault with the Ten Commandments. But if a man can convince himself of the nullification of the law of God, he can convince himself that man's law is not worth a hill of beans. And that's what's happened today. And that's why Paul said in the last days, perilous times shall come. Men have lost faith in the Bible and the God of our fathers. And the natural tendency is to lose faith in his fellow man. Evolution allows no faith in God and therefore no fall of man. Evolution says man never fell. He's ascending from the primeval slime of the ages. You know, we believe it. And the higher you go in school, the more you feel the pressure to believe it. We go off to college singing, I'm a child of the king, and we come home on spring break singing, I'm the child of an ape. Men have abandoned hope of heaven and eternal life. And they view this earth as a potential utopia, and they know it's not working out. 
They have abandoned the gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation. And they are telling you, don't worry about changing folk. Make them comfortable as they are. Someone has said, don't bring the prodigal son home. Plant a few roses in the pig pen so that he'll be happy where he is. They have abandoned hope in the way that God has planned for men to be saved by faith and have proclaimed salvation through education. And I'm sad to tell you our universities today have become centers of filth. The campus is crawling in many cases with pot, with pot smoking junkies, co-eds who are profligates, shacking up with fellow students and living in dormitories where men and women share the same bathrooms. On great campuses of the world, subtle forms of evil are captivating men's minds. This only produces educated, smarter crooks impeachable politicians and disturbed and disbarred lawyers. Then they have abandoned the gospel as the only way in favor of what they call comparative religion. They have said to Christians, stop bothering men who don't believe as you believe. And Christians have listened. And so the unchristian world today seethes with terrorism and is explosive. Men without Christ and a concept of his life can blow up busloads of women and children and then issue a worldwide communique bragging that they can take the credit. Ladies and gentlemen, man has made a mess for himself. Science, which he worships, has betrayed him. Instead of being the new Messiah to save him from sickness and poverty and disease, it has given him fallout, pollution, it has affected the ozone layer, plagues, capricious weather, and threats of oblivion. And yet we are shamed out of our faith. But we are creatures of faith. I'm not asking you, and Christ did not ask you, would you have faith? Everybody has that. His question is, will you have faith in God and faith in the truth? We are creatures of faith. You walked in this auditorium and you plopped down in your chair. Never once did you question whether that chair would support you. You sat down because of faith in the chair. You don't even know that this roof won't crash down and smash you to smithereens. You're not even thinking about it. You got faith in the roof. Some of you pay your bills by mail and you take an important, even critical, check and put it in an envelope and seal it, then put a little old stamp on there about the size of my thumb nail and you drop it in a box, an impersonal box on a corner somewhere, and you go home and tell your wife, I paid the bill. You haven't paid anything. You put a check in a box by faith. Get on an elevator in that hotel and go up ten floors, nothing under you but a big black hole by faith. You sit down over here and eat every bit of it. How do you know somebody didn't go crazy and poison the food? Faith. And so the Lord asks a reasonable question. He says, when the Son of Man cometh, will he find faith? Faith in God and faith in the Word and faith in the message he has called us to share. Ellen White lists in progressive order the steps in apostasy. If you want to read them, it's volume 5, page 672. She said the first thing the devil seeks to do is weaken faith in the testimony. Number two, to make you dissatisfied with those at the head of the work. Young people, don't you fall for this stupidity. Everybody is knocking leadership. Well, I want to tell you who the leader is. It's God Almighty. And the under-shepherds following his direction. Don't fall for it. That's number two. Number three, she said, would be skepticism concerning the pillars of our faith. Number four, they will lose confidence in the scriptures. And number five, the downward path to perdition. You want to go to hell? That's out. Paul wrote his final letter to Timothy. And he greeted him with these words. Teach no other doctrine. Neither give heed to fables 
and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith. Edifying means building up and making strong in faith, not in doubting and speculating and hesitancy. Now these are the dying counsels of St. Paul, not only to Timothy, but to unborn Timothys who would attend this meeting. How does Paul end his life? How does he conclude his ministry? Does he write like a tired old man? Is he weary of a restrictive faith? Is he sorry he was so strict in his life? Will he modify his doctrines with so-called new light? Will he urge a split in the church because there are some hypocrites in it? How will Paul end his life after his final amen? In 2 Timothy 4, he will fall down before the executioner. He will see the sharp blade lifted in the air, flashing in the sun. That blade would fall. And those standing around would jerk as they would hear the awful crunch of a blade severing a neck bone. And the head of God's apostle would thump to the ground, roll in glorious land. Eyes still open, looking toward heaven. How stood the old man? How did he go out? Trembling? Scared? Oh, no. He wrote in his obituary before his death, I finished my course. Fought a good fight. I have kept the faith against all odds. Hypocrites in the church, devils on the outside. Markings and new light and whatever. I have kept the faith. He said, Father, I'm not ashamed. Though all appearances seem to be against me. Rome is alive with the devil. Virtue is in jail. But he said to Timothy, hold fast. The Greek says, grab it with every finger and grip tight. Young people, hold on to your faith. I ask today in this audience, who has the devilish audacity to reshuffle our theological cards and modify or dilute our doctrinal positions? Who has been commissioned by God to rearrange our credenda? Who, with incredible egoism, mistakes the sparks of his own kindling for new light? only blinding and bemusing those who focus on them. And I ask the rest of us, why are we so impressionable? Why do we put so much confidence in man? Man doesn't do too much well. It was man who named the eighth month, the tenth month, October, and octopus means eight. It was man who named the tenth month, December the twelfth, and decimus means ten. Man hasn't done too well. You know, it's amazing the burdens that insects have to bear. You look up a lightning bug and look at the load of Greek and Latin he has to carry without a word of his consent. Man is so smart, he can't even call him a lightning bug. And we are impressed by polysyllabic palava. The world says if it feels good, do it. And some today are saying if it sounds intellectual, believe it. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I don't want bigotry or narrow-mindedness or exclusivism or provincialism which breeds and feeds on the refuse of uncharitableness. But we do want and we do need something like dignity, certainty, and clearness of perception in the church. You'd better get a hold of something you believe and hold on to it instead of always finding some little piece of paper on which something is written that you don't quite make out over which protracted conversations are held uh, until common sense is suspended in the languid limbo of skepticism. Some people every week are wondering whether their religion will be on blue mimeograph paper or pink mimeograph paper. I say it ought to come from the word of God. What do you say? 
and the propositions ought to be well founded on a rock. We ought not let the devil cause us to retreat beyond the rock. There are some who are so intellectually vain they are cursed to the church. They are the ones who cause the writing of books on the shaking of the remnant church. They are the ones who cause the heathen to gather on the periphery of light and cry, Ichabod. There's always a shatter at the edge of the light. And if you increase the candle power, it does not remove the shadow. It simply drives it farther out. And some are far. They are thieves caught with their hands in the church's pocket. Grotesque. Not sure of anything. And the sad acknowledgement from this desk today is there are some who preach and teach who are so namby-pamby they are afraid to proclaim what they know. I read of a preacher who got up to preach and he saw so many educated folks and so many money folks. He said to them, if you folks don't repent, sort of, and overcome sin to some extent, you're going to hell somewhat. I want to tell you young people that some things are sure today. And I want to tell you to come to the cross, whatever your theories and speculations and metaphysics may be, and stay there until you can cry out with a centurion, truly this man was the son of God. Righteousness by faith is not an argument. It's a way of life. And it is so simple that my uneducated forebears could believe it and go to sleep in Jesus with smiles on their faces. Christ at the cross has done something for me that I could never do for myself and that no other person in the universe could do besides himself. And I thank God that I believe on him. I thank God for a holy high priest who rose up from the dead because my poor lost soul needs such a priest. I do not come to the cross a respectable man. Respectable men have no business at the cross. I come to the cross without any right to speak. I do not come as a wise theologian. I come on my hands and my knees, my eyes blinded by tears, my throat choking in my own agony. I come to the cross, my conscience on fire. And I find there that the book tells me he died for me. The blood running down will wash away my sins. And I believe it. I accept this by faith. And he converts me. And he takes up in me his own residence, Paul said, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Not only that, but he writes his Ten Commandments on my mind. So that when I think about sin, I think what the law says. Let's say amen out there. This is righteousness by faith. There is no dichotomy between Paul, who said not by works, or James, who said, faith without works is dead. Paul was talking to heathen who believed in meritorious religion. James, as the president of the World Council at that time, had to balance the issue. And that's what we need to do. Balance it! There is no faith without works. And there is no works without faith that will avail. And if I fall, Listen to me now, I'm closing, so don't watch your watches. If I fall, he doesn't throw me away. Everybody ought to say it. Come on. If I fall, he does not throw me away. He says if any man sins, he's got an advocate with the Father. Let him come boldly to the throne of grace. He can still impute righteousness to cover my fall while he imparts righteousness by which I am sanctified. And in the sight of God, I am perfect, not because I am without a flaw, but because I am covered with the life of Christ 
and he is perfect. That is righteousness by faith. And he walks with me. And he talks with me. And he tells me I am his own. And the joy that we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. This establishes a love relationship. And Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. He says that explicitly, implicitly. He says, if you don't love me, forget it. You start with Christ. You live by Christ. You die with Christ. You'll rise with Christ. You'll be glorified with Christ. Man only needs Christ. And yet Ellen White said in Manuscript 40, those who think it matters not what they do as long as they believe in Christ are involved in dangerous heresy and fatal delusion. Real faith looks to Jesus. Christ looks to real faith. The eye of faith meets the eye of Jesus. Hallelujah! What a Savior! And all is mine, appropriated by faith. There was a council of war. During the Civil War, General Thomas was told to retreat. His answer to Rosecrans was, this army can't retreat. We don't know how. When the devil tells you to retreat from the pinnacle of faith, tell him you don't know how. Though there are times when it seems the church will fail. Though there are times when you are falling and cannot get yourself together. Though there are times when you don't even know why you stay in the church. Say to the devil, I can't retreat. Randy Stafford was in a, an airplane in a storm. The airplane was bouncing and corkscrewing and going out of control. Randy said he tightened his seatbelt. He grabbed a hold of the armrests. He looked at the stewardesses. Randy said he did everything he could do except get off the plane. My young friends, the old ship of Zion is going to make it. Church is going to triumph. There's going to be a shaking time. A storm is coming. And you will feel like doing almost anything. But don't get off. Don't get off. What's going to happen to God's church? It's going through. It shall triumph. It is the promise of the Lord. And if that's a lie, God is a lie. I believe it with all my heart and with all my soul. In volume one, Ellen White tells the story of a sermon preached by Elder Andrews. And in that sermon, he told of two martyrs about to die. One of them was going to be burned first, and the other made to watch. The one who was chosen to watch was just a little bit shaky. Oh, he believed in God, but he was afraid of what was going to happen. So he went over to his fellow martyr, and he said to him, You are going to the flame first. When you go to the flame, as the fire does its work, before you lose consciousness, I want you to give me some kind of signal that our faith is strong enough to sustain us. That God will not abandon us. I want you to give me some kind of signal that God's power with faith stronger than the flame. As his brother shook his hand, he said, there will be a signal. Watch for it. Watch for it. But they tied him to the stake. They piled up the wood. They brought in the faggots. The flames began to crackle. And to leap up, almost obscure, the vision of the martyr made to watch. But he stared into the flame, looking for a signal, looking for a signal. The flames raged. The clothing began to burn off. He thought, surely he has died without giving me the signal. Maybe our faith cannot sustain us. And as he was about to commence doubting, suddenly... The flames burned through the bonds that tied the martyr. 
Even though his flesh was now black and there seemed to be no life in him, the minute his hands were free, both arms shot up toward heaven. And the man about to go to the flame said, Tie me up. Go ahead and burn me now. I know in whom I have believed and that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Young folks, don't you believe it? Don't you want to believe it? Hold fast. Hold fast. When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith 